Sinhalese, we decided upon as the official language because 70% of the people of Ceylon are Sinhalese. I don't think so. I think I'm not afraid of alienating Tamil opinion. I'm afraid of alienating public opinion in the world. Well, the roots of the Tamil problem arise from the inability of governments after Sri Lanka achieved independence in 48 to work out the constitutional foundations of a plural society. I have been the first Sinhala leader to pronounce on election platforms, which is normally considered fatal politically. That the Tamil people have been discriminated against, that we have to correct the situation, uh, that they have to be, we have to share power with them. Your country and other countries, including large section in India, have a wrong impression of what is happening there. This is an ethnic conflict, it's not an ethnic conflict. The stage is Sri Lanka. The date, 19th November, 2005. Mahindra Rajapaksa is sworn in for his first term as president of the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka. By this time, the civil war between the LTTE and the government had been going on for 22 years. In January 2006, just two months later, the president convened an all-party representative committee, or APRC, to solve the national question. In July 2006, the president said, after two decades of a protracted, cruel and violent conflict, the country cannot wait any longer to usher in a just and sustainable peace for all peoples of Sri Lanka. It followed many important precedents from the time of J.R. Jawodhana to Rana Singha Premadasa and Chandrika Kumaratunga. In short, it was a historic moment. The APRC consisted of 15 parties, including the SLFP and the JHU, and minority parties such as the Ceylon Workers' Congress and the Sri Lanka Muslim Congress. It was just not a committee uh, sitting to finalize a common document. It was a process of negotiation. You know, there were representatives from Tamil parties, Muslim parties, and the Sinhala political parties. Initially, the main opposition party, the UNP, said that the JHU and the JVP enjoyed disproportionate sway in the APRC, which undermined the moderate voice. Actually, if you consider the time taken by each annual speaker, I think in uh, several periods of time, I must be the speaker who has spoken the longest. But by October 2006, the UNP had signed a memorandum of understanding that guaranteed them greater representation and they took part in the APRC. And I felt, uh, you know, really we thought enthusiasm was at the height of it. We thought, okay, now we are going to find the solution because the president was very determined, the war is on. He was telling the international community and having a parallel, you know, process going on. So I'll eradicate the terrorism. The moment it is eradicated, your report should be ready so I can straight away implement the solution, political solution. Uh, many proposals that were already uh, in the public domain uh, at the time that the APRC sat, and given the very encouraging words spoken by the president, unexpected that uh, if the APRC functioned as uh, we all expected, that something would emerge. But unfortunately, we did not even see the APRC report eventually. Tissavitharana, representing the Lanka Samasamaja Party, was unanimously decided upon by the other members of the APRC to chair the meetings after a successful first meeting. First meeting was, uh, I would put it in a nutshell by saying, rather strong. 
because uh, there were representatives from the different political parties which had uh, widely different views on the national question. And there was a, not only a certain amount of suspicion, but there was also at times open hostility which surfaced in the course of our initial uh, discussion. The process of bringing together individuals from different backgrounds with different political perspectives, agendas and styles was not an easy one. We don't see any problem specific to Tamil people. Just because of you have sacrificed so many lives would not justify your cause. You may be mad. Because of that you may sacrifice lives. Uh, the objective of the government was to essentially to break the backbone of Tamil resistance. History tells us that the hearts and minds of people cannot in such a way be subjugated. However, if there is seething discontent, you can't go back to war and annihilate populations. You have to talk to them, bring them along, and that is what a political settlement is all about. He also indicated that uh, uh, what we came out with uh, would it also be used by him uh, in future talks with the LTTE. So this was very challenging. This was something that uh, was vitally important to uh, take, uh, bring a solution uh, to the national question and hopefully bring the war to an end. So we were uh, very, uh, shall we say, uh, hopeful as well as uh, excited at the prospect of trying to uh, help in taking this whole process forward. While the civil war against the LTTE was being waged in the north and east, the APRC was being marketed and publicized to the world and to the Sri Lankan public as a solution that would be offered to the Tamil polity. In 2006 December, when President Rajapaksha and I visited India, we gave even gave an assurance to the Indian government that the report will be implemented before April of 2007. The disproportionately male APRC committee was branded the Southern Consensus. And despite poor female representation and the absence of the main Tamil political party, the TNA, some even called it a national consensus. I believe that it was more than a southern consensus. It was a national consensus because the issues of the Tamil people were discussed there. There were representatives of the EPDP. So got TMVP into the process at the last moment. And uh, we had uh, other Tamil political parties such as the Upcountry People's Front and the Democratic People's Front in this uh, process. Participants were enthusiastic about the negotiations and saw it as a means of ending the violence and terror in Sri Lanka. In 1983, the violence peaked in bloody massacres which took as many as 1,500 lives and led 100,000 Tamils to flee abroad. On April the 21st this year, 107 people died when a car bomb devastated the crowded terminus. With each meeting there was a vision and a promise of a better future. A future filled with peace. A future in which the minorities of Sri Lanka could live together with the majority in an inclusive democracy. In December 2006, the JVP, which was the third largest political party represented in Parliament at the time, boycotted the APRC publicly stating that they were not interested in formulating a political solution based on the concept of federalism. In addition to that, I think there is this notion that if you give federalism, it's a thin edge of the wedge, as it were. You know, they'll take this today and they'll want more tomorrow. And that federalism in that way will facilitate secession. But this is counter-historical. I mean, the arguments for secession and the rise of the LTT and indeed 30 years of war had nothing to do because one shared power. It was because one consolidated power at the center. In January of the next year, some members of the UNP crossed over to the SLFP. As a result, the UNP claimed that the MOU was abrogated and decided to leave the APRC. 
Spectators and participants both claimed that the president placed undue pressure on members of the APRC and attempted to move it in a direction outside of its natural progression. The content of his uh, inaugural statement was very encouraging. I'm not personally aware, but uh, it would appear that at a certain stage of the APRC process, when the process is moving largely in accordance with the definition of the contours that the president had indicated in his inaugural speech, some participants at the APRC were not very happy with the way in which things were moving and that they were exerting their influence on the president uh, not to allow the protest to move on those lines. I mean, for instance, uh, pressure was brought on me uh, during the APRC process uh, to take uh, uh, stands which uh, uh, were not in accordance with the consensus that was emerging. But I refused to do that. Some within the government were also starting to believe that the president was not genuine about the APRC and the government's commitment to produce a credible national solution. SLFP representative at the APRC Vishwa Varnapala did not agree to an interview, but it was becoming clear that significant ruptures were beginning to form within the SLFP. And two weeks later, uh, I was also removed from government uh, because I did raise all these issues, issues in a 13-page letter, which I wrote to the president at that time. So senior SLF peers, I think, felt that in effect they were hitting a glass ceiling and that unless they sort of played the role of courtier to the royal Rajapaksa family, politically they had nowhere else to go. Despite the eroding faith of some domestic actors, the international community recognized Rajapaksa's political power and his potential to bring about a change in Sri Lanka if he was committed to it. They continued to court this possibility. President Rajpaksa was a politician par excellence. He was very good and continues to be, even out of office, especially adept at evaluating, gauging the public mood and responding to it. As late as May 2008, Robert Blake said, if a credible power-sharing proposal emerges from the APRC, Sri Lanka has, in President Rajapaksa, a strong leader who can use his considerable political skills and the trust that his supporters repose in him to help fashion the southern consensus that has eluded previous governments. Others were critical and suggested that perhaps the APRC deserved to be forgotten. They should come out with facts and figures to justify their stand. But they ju just laughed at our uh, document and just rejected it without giving any rationality, without giving any justification. So we felt they are not ready to compromise. They have not come to open mind. They have just decided decide to stick to their original stand. Whatever the uh, things discuss and reveal at the APRC, middle of the process we felt that, you know, there is no proper dialogue. There is a document and uh, the majority of parties are in agreement with the document prepared by the chairman and they, in, instead of having an open dialogue, they were pressurizing the others to accept what they believe as correct. So we felt it's not correct, so we decided to withdraw from the APRC process. When the JHU withdrew, they claimed that the attempts made by the APRC were a conspiracy to reverse military victories that the APRC chairman was a conspirator supporting the LTTE. In the face of an increasingly damning human rights record, the APRC was becoming more and more important in sustaining the government's public image of commitment to progressive reform. The day that La Santa was killed was horrible. I, I think Lal, his brother, who is chairman of this newspaper, telephoned me. He was half crying and he said La Santa had been shot. And uh, I rushed to the hospital and watched him die. There brooked no 
criticism of what they were doing. They weren't interested in uh, addressing grievances, alternative opinions of any sort. And so what you had was the sure and steady shrinking of space for civil society and dissent. Despite some groups leaving, the APRC carried on. Its members met for three to four hours every week for three years and reported back to their parties between meetings. At every meeting, they came closer to reaching a final consensus. And towards the end, many members even started engaging as a team instead of as several competing representatives. The APRC provides for extensive devolution of power. Uh, clear condition of powers, although it uh, still uses the phrase unitary state, right? And uh, it also accepts that, that Sri Lanka is a multicultural country. It uh, it also it goes to the extent of uh, adopting the majority reports uh, proposal that the uh, constituent peoples of Sri Lanka be recognized, and that the con that the, every constituent people will have its due share of state power. It's an extraordinary day, extraordinary hour or two that we've just been through. Uh, the man that personified the Tamil Tigers, a feared uh, man who set up a personality cult, he has been shot dead. Uh, they say that he was trying to escape. The 19th of May 2009 marked the end of the Sri Lankan Civil War. So we knew that the money, that the funding is going to come to an end. So we worked virtually, you know, on the clock meeting more than once in a week to finalize the report and we are very optimistic and very enthusiastic. No one was prepared for what happened next. I prepared uh, the full report which was in, in English and uh, which came to close to 100 pages. Along with this I met the president and uh, uh, at that meeting, there were, uh, besides the president, uh, the secretary to the president, and uh, some uh, leading members of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party. But the president failed to respond. Though he had included five of uh, our proposals in a modified form, into his uh, manifesto. This was not uh, uh, really implemented uh, thereafter. So that has really been the final outcome. And for months, the members of the APRC simply waited. It seemed the president was not interested. So it was quite disappointing that a lot of hard work, serious negotiations that had taken place, were not utilized by the government to take forward uh, this process to satisfy the Tamil people and not uh, any extremist force, but the common Tamil man in the North East. Up to now, uh, nothing of what we have proposed has been uh, implemented. Therefore, it is... Uh, very uh, disappointing after all the hard work. That was uh, a time consuming as well as, uh, shall we say, uh, a difficult task to find that uh, that is not being made use of, it's not being implemented, uh, is uh, certainly uh, very disheartening. The government was not serious about implementing any of the promises with its, its own cabinet and maybe with its friends in India and elsewhere. In January 2010, it was reported that the president of Sri Lanka had made his clearest dismissal of the APRC proposals, stating, I'm going to put forward my own solution to the problem. Mr. Rajapaksa is the president of Sri Lanka. He doesn't believe that he has to give reasons for rejecting this document. He never acknowledged that he received this document, nor did he give reasons for rejecting the document. And we heard nothing about it. One month, two months, three months, four months. 
then we got so frustrated and the uh, war was over the report was not not to be not released to the public and there was an a promise by the president that he will release it he didn't do it after mahindra rajapaksa won the election on the 27th of january 2010 and began his second term projecting the perception of sri lankan democracy became even less important and the military spokesman confirmed that fonseca had been arrested saying that it related to offences committed during his time in the army he is responsible he is a that's a treason we will hang him if you do that i'm telling you that's a treason you would not how can you would tell that how how can he lie that so at this juncture two members of the aprc nizam karyappa and aryo garajan decided that they had waited long enough and in july 2010 they went public with the final report so in that frustration me and sir yoga rajan thought it, it to let's do justice to the work that we did let's go public so after achieving all that if it cannot be uh, made public where the people would know what really happened at these negotiations what a fair solution could be all the efforts we had put in would have gone waste and up to date nobody has challenged that this is not the report that was handed over to the president by the chairman so it remains the most credible document the walls of the very good there wasn't much of an objection from those who participated in the APRC itself most uh, political parties at that particular moment we tried we support that people. good thing that they came out with it uh, but i couldn't uh, <laughs> uh, support it despite the report being released there was no response from the president cynics believe that the president never had any intention of releasing the report uh, mahindra rajapaksa was the uh, uh the person who led the procession that uh, did the sit down uh, opposite the boat in uh, petra right uh, protesting against uh, the 13th amendment being uh, implemented so that was his original uh, position against devolution uh, altogether i know mandra has explained well he has always been a person who opposed any form of revolution even while he was in the Tamil Nadu Manipur some who had felt that the APRC findings were never officially recognized said the APRC was just a show for the international community so it was used by the government at that time merely to keep the international community at bay when uh, an atrocious war was going on he would have felt that the political compassion is not there then he would have said then why should i give it it was becoming obvious to all the stakeholders that the government was merely playing for time because western forces were telling unless you formulate a political solution we will interfere with your military advancement so we were we we were about to see an end to the terrorism after 37 years but we are under pressure unless we formulate a political solution they would not allow us to move forward because of that pressure uh, in certain certain places we decide to compromise just to buy time to finish the war so that was a strategic in a way because we were under pressure so those documents were prepared under pressure so we don't accept it as something we agree with the free mind the ultimate essential site of rebellion is in people's hearts and minds and you can't use ak47s or bomb that out of them so probably the one thing that i can learn from this process is in the absence of a political compulsion nothing will take place the majority population can think why they should give any devolution at all right if it is understanding the need to keep this country one then 
anyone would accept the APRC recommendations. In a poll done by the University of Liverpool, an ethnically diverse sample was asked, would you support a package of constitutional reforms for Sri Lanka as outlined here? In March 2009, 67% of Sinhalese people said yes, 86% of Tamil people said yes, and 90% of Muslims interviewed said yes. In 2010, after the war, 83% of Sinhalese interviewees, 84% of Tamil interviewees, and 80% of Muslim interviewees said they would support the APRC constitutional package. Instead of following through with his promises, the president began to strengthen his hold on power. has further centralized power in the office of the executive presidency. Mr. Speaker, I rise to speak today with a very heavy heart. Not even half a year has passed since I stepped into this assembly for the first time. I did not realize then that I'll be participating in a debate such as this on a bill that threatens to finally nail the coffin in which democracy of this country had been laid for some time. The argument has been made that a number of these ministers supported the 18th Amendment in Parliament and took time in coming out against the Rajapaksas because they were frightened of the consequences. And secondly, that the Rajapaksas had a lot of dirt on them. Alongside increasing allegations of corruption, faith in Mahindra Rajapaksa began to decline. By now, had have built up a greater understanding, a greater sense of confidence, and uh, uh, been closer to achieving uh, national unity to build uh, really a Sri Lankan identity uh, and to get uh, uh, rid of uh, racial, uh, religious and caste uh, prejudices and come together as one Sri Lankan uh, people. Uh, that process, I think, has unfortunately not yet uh, taken place. But at the same time, they must realize that the people in the North and East and the other minorities living all over this country feel that they will be having a sense of equality only if powers are given to their people, at least in one region of this country. But the situation in Sri Lanka continued to deteriorate. Uh, there are certain grievances, there are certain suspicions uh, which uh, muddy the water and uh, therefore there are, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, strong opinions being expressed uh, uh, of a communal nature. Uh, which are not conducive to building national unity. The war is over. There is no violence to the extent that we used to have. I mean, inter uh, ethnic violence. But uh, today, uh, we still are. We are still. We are. We are yet to win the peace, in the sense that the ethnic political conflict uh, continues despite the uh, absence of uh, violence. To that extent, 
the evolution is important. I mean, it is true that bombs are not going off, but uh, the danger of the conflict escalating is always there. And that is why you do need to find a new constitutional kind of structure and edifice that uh, addresses these issues. If the government is honest about it and is genuine about it, and wants to engage in a process which ensures a solution within the framework of a united and divided Sri Lanka that grants the maximum possible autonomy which can be negotiated. We are prepared. We have always been prepared. And we are committed to making our genuine contribution towards the evolution of an acceptable political. Have to now be down to the end of the week. Of course, you can't expect this government to ever end. So, hopefully, the future of will take the challenge uh, of the time and try to address the issue once and for all. In January 2015, a presidential election was held. The opposition formed a coalition consisting of many different political parties on the basis of abolishing the executive presidency. In a strategically choreographed move, Maitripala Sirisena, a minister in Mahinda Rajapaksa's own party, crossed over from the SLFP to become the common candidate. He won the elections by garnering votes from all communities of Sri Lanka. Mahinda Rajapaksa would not win a third term in office. The president's 100-day manifesto and pledge on women promise a better future for all Sri Lankans in spite of their ethnicity gender or religion. Now Sri Lanka faces the important challenge of a new constitution. Will the promise to Sri Lankans of living in an equal, just and plural society ever be fulfilled? Or will the political dance continue?